I ask you for your participation. On the theme of the first session is the green data and tape between South and North Korea vision and tasks. And I have great expectations for the discussions that will come up during the session. We have all the participants up on the stage. Please welcome them with a big round of applause. 네, 그리고 저는 좌장님께 마이크를 넘기도록 Now I will hand over the microphone to the chair of the session. Yes, now today we are here at the DMZ Global Forum 2022. So now we shall begin session one. My name is Hong Yong Pyo and I will be serving as your moderator. And as the MC has just explained earlier, so it was supposed to be former minister Hong Yong Pyo who was going to serve as a moderator, but then uh, due to unexpected circumstances um, in the home, so I came here on his behalf. Now, I have the same family name, Hong, and uh, my name is Hong Yang Ho, and Actually, uh, in my family, we do not use the uh, same uh, middle name. So well, as a member of the same family, I am here uh, to fill his place. So now then, in this session, under the theme of Green Detente between South and North Korea, Vision and Task, we'll be listening to the insight from five speakers. Now, as you would know, when we say green, then it denotes stability and abundance of nature. So we hope to bring in stable green abundance on the Korean Peninsula so that we can contribute to easing of the tension between the two Koreas and going further to lay the shortcut to unification on the Korean Peninsula. So that is what we mean by green detente. Now, the five speakers in this session, as you can see in the program, we have Professor Park In-hee from Ihua Women's University, and then we have Professor Solon Simmons from George Mason University. We also have Mats Engman, so researcher at the Institute for Security and Development Policy. We also have His Excellency Akiva Tor, the ambassador of Israel to Korea and Professor Nishino Junya from KU University, due to the unexpected circumstances, he will be joining us online today. Now then, for the four speakers, let me briefly introduce them. So from my far left side, let me begin with Professor Park. Now, Professor Park received his PhD in political science from Northwestern University. And currently, he is serving as the Professor of International Studies at Ihua Women's University. He was a member of the Standing Committee of the Peaceful Unification Advisory Council. And also, presently, he is a member of the Board of Directors of the Korea Peace Foundation. So here is Professor Park. And following Professor Park, we have Professor Solon Simmons, who received his PhD in Sociology from the University of Wisconsin Medicine and he has been serving as a professor at George Mason University, also served as the Vice President for Global Strategy. So here is Professor Solon Simmons. And next to him, we have the Distinguished Military Fellow of the Institute for Security and Development Policy of Sweden, Mr. Mats Engman. Now, he graduated from the Swedish Command and Staff College and also served in uh, postgraduate studies at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. He was in the military for close to 40 years and was also the Swedish defense attache to the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland in the military field. So here is Mr. Mats Engman. Last but not least, His Excellency Akiva Tor, Ambassador of Israel to Korea. He received his master's degree 
in political science and contemporary Jewish thought at Hebrew University. And from 2020 to present, he has been serving as the ambassador of Israel to the Republic of Korea. Now, he was also the head of Bureau for World Jewish Affairs and World Religions. And also, he was at the Israel Consul General in San Francisco and Pacific Northwest and World Jewish Affairs Advisor to the President of Israel. He also served as a Deputy Director of the Department of Palestinian Affairs. So here is His Excellency Akiva Tor. And now the order of the program today is that we will be first listening to the panelists followed by a panel discussion. Now there has been some delay in the schedule already, so I would like to give about 10 to 15 minutes to each panelist. So now we shall begin with Professor Park. Uh, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, uh, my name is Inhui Park uh, from Ihua Women's University. It is a great honor to be able to speak to you today at this large international forum. In the booklet uh, of the forum, I you can find the written remarks, brief talking points in English. And I thought about how to present myself today and because I uh, can see many Korean people uh, among the members of the audience today. I would like to speak in Korean. So let me start with uh, something that's very easy for you to understand when it comes to international politics or diplomacy. Most often times English as a language is used, but other foreign languages could be used as well. For instance, as you must be well aware, uh, there are many expressions in French. The theme of today's forum includes the word detente and agrément is something that you get uh, as a, an appointed a diplomatic officer at the high level. And as of the armistice, armistice agreement, we will be marking the 7th year of the National Division. And after the Second World War, due to the elements of international politics, uh, some of the countries remain divided. For instance, the case of Germany was one. And slightly before that, because Germany was uh, divided during the post-Cold War era. Uh, there's another country that was divided, that's Vietnam. And most of the countries are respecting uh, one China policy, so we cannot really use the word division or divided nation. But we can also point to the case of China versus Taiwan. And although it could be a little more complicated, uh, we can think about the Yemen uh, that was uh, reuni reunified in the 1990s. And personally, I believe that there's this case of us, the Korean Peninsula, uh, that was influenced uh, most heavily by the elements of international politics. So due to many circum circumstances, and historical development, some countries were able to achieve reunification, but Korea still remains in confrontation between the two Koreas. I talked about this word, this French word, detente, in the beginning, in the mid 1970s. Um, also in Europe as well as in Asia, there was this grand wave of detente. And the Korean Peninsula was unable to take part in that wave uh, due to deep confrontation and conflict between the two Koreas. Uh, the detente in the 70s uh, was a mainstream trend. Uh, but uh, the Noteo government of South Korea, the North politic, was a small wave of detente that was attempted by one of the previous governments in Korea. 
uh, expectations about reunification uh, was prevalent at that time. But this small scale effort towards the detente uh, did not come true, and it did not lead to the reunification of the two Koreas. Uh, it's been about uh, three decades since the end of the Cold War era. However, confrontation between the two Koreas have worsened in some sense, and especially in the case of the DPRK, it is bent on its nuclear development um, for the sake of its own survival, according to them. If you go to the uh, Uni United Nations site, uh, there are about 193 uh, members, and more than 180 are members of the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty. And of the NPT members, North Korea is the only country that has attempted to develop its own nuclear weapons. So in many ways, uh, North Korea is posing a threat uh, to peace and stability of the international community. For the past 30 years, in order to change North Korea, including the efforts based on green detente, uh, many attempts were made. Uh, various efforts were made in order to make North Korea abandon its, North Cor its nuclear program. Uh, both conservative and progressive governments took turns in governing South Korea and North Korean policies in various uh, types and colors were attempted by multiple governments of Korea. But did that lead to the change on the part of North Korea, if that is the question posed? Or uh, did North Korea give up on its nuclear program? If that is a question uh, posed to us, uh, the uh, efforts made by the Korean governments and the international community, all of those endeavors have become failures. They failed. So before I share my personal opinions about the North Korean policy, uh, all these policies and endeavors uh, that were attempted uh, over the past three decades, uh, they failed, as I told you previously. And we need to think about why uh, those efforts did not lead to any success. I think uh, trying to find the answer to those questions uh, could be relevant for our discussion of our topic today, Green Titante. So let's uh, take a look back on what we did in the past. I would like to cite two to three reasons behind our failures. Uh, this was briefly mentioned by Mr. Yu, uh, but he did not go into any detail about this. So you might not have been able to capture this point. When it comes to our North Korean policies, uh, functionalism has failed. That's one aspect of it. A functionalist North Korean policy, whether it was the conservative government or progressive government, uh, that functionalist approach has been adopted by all of the governments in Korea. For instance, uh, the sunshine policy was one example, as well as the one that was attempted by the conservative government. The North Korean a bonanza policy uh, that if we provide benefits to North Korea, they would open up and uh, give up uh, their nuclear program. All of those uh, policies had their own rationale. Uh, they wanted to induce North Korea to change uh, so that they can abandon their nuclear programs. Uh, this was so-called low politics based on social and economic assistance and exchange between peoples and the Korean governments had those expectations uh, that such efforts were leading to North Korea's abandonment of nuclear programs. 
Well, maybe some may think that there were other reasons、uh, than the failure of such functionalism. But broadly speaking,、um, the biggest advantage of functionalism was the facilitation of social and economic exchange. However, the spillover effect of such economic and social exchanges、uh, did not happen towards the political sphere. Uh, and that hasn't happened in the past, and I don't think it will happen in the future either. And at the same time, especially this year,、uh, starting from one day, I just gave up on counting the number of their missile launches.、Uh, many times they, fi they fired missiles towards the Korean Peninsula. When it comes to the nuclear problem, the North Korea has its own logic, but it is very unreasonable.、Uh, it, however, it is meaningless for us to、uh, dig deep into why their claim is unreasonable. They're saying that it's for the sake of its own survival. The assistance. To the Kaesong Industrial Complex and the Kumgang Mountain tourism packages,、uh, all those could be attractive、uh, offers to North Korea, but they would never be willing to replace、uh, their nuclear program with those、uh, packages. So this logic、uh, that North Korea is holding on to for its own nuclear development、uh, has been strengthened over the past 30 years, and. This year, they ha are attempting、uh, many more types of、uh, nuclear tests. So that is、uh, something that we can learn、uh, from the past thirty years' experiences. And they and another factor is the international factor,、uh, the factor involving the U.S. and China. Uh, no matter how much I emphasize this international factor, I think it's not enough. And personally, the、uh, Kim Jong Il's、uh, strategic ambiguity regarding nuclear development、uh, has been abandoned by his son Kim Jong Un. And starting from 2013, the so-called A nuclear development of North Korea has been gathering speed, and starting from 2021,、uh, due to structural competition deepening between the U.S. and China,、um, because that、uh, competition has become more pronounced structurally, and due to this confused era in international politics, North Korea seems to be calculating. Uh, that its、uh, development of nuclear weapons、uh, would be left untouched. So these are the lessons that we learned from our past experiences, and it is on that basis that, that I would like to talk about the topic today, Green Tante. The Yoon Suk Yeol administration、uh, is. A conservative government, as you must be well aware,、uh, it is pursuing the North Korean policy based on the rule of law and、um, principles. And at the same time, of its 100 national policies, a number 96 or 98 is the. Engagement policy towards North Korea.、Um, the government is fully aware of the importance of engaging with North Korea. So its North Korean policy is based on principles. But when necessary, as can be seen、uh, in its audacious initiative, it is understanding the importance of engaging with North Korea. And the Green Tente project is something that I can support myself. But to talk about. Two to three points about this. When it comes to the North Korean issue, there are aspects that can be promoted by the central government, but at the same time,、uh, there are things、uh, that can be done by local governments, such as the Gyeonggi Province government. Therefore, this、uh, Green Peace Zone (DMZ) project、uh, is something that should be promoted based on the right division of labor between the central、uh, and local government. 
Uh, politically, this could be a little controversial. However, uh, the previous government of Korea, uh, President Moon, I don't know what to say, how to put it in exact words. I'm sorry, but the previous government of Korea pursued the nuclear phase-out policy, which was quite controversial. Uh, but I think that this eco-friendly project of Green Peace Zone in DMZ could be helpful in diffusing the controversy because it's a green project. And President Biden, uh, after being elected uh, in uh, 2013, uh, he said himself that he would be ready to go rejoin the Paris Agreement as soon as possible, that as soon as he was elected. And uh, climate was, is the issue uh, that is uh, drawing attention of the entire world. And building a green peace zone in the DMZ is an environmental project. And this Green Jetang Te program, I believe, is indeed very meaningful. But then again, as I said previously, if the Green Detente project goes well, would it be easily translated into better uh, or stronger peace and prosperity between the two Koreas? Maybe we need to be cautious about that expectation. And at the same time, regarding the nuclear development of North Korea, how well are we going to manage or control that is something that we need to take into account as we pursue this Green Detente project. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks due to time constraints. I will not summarize the presentation. And now we will move on to the next presentation. So under the theme of Green Detente and perspective on the easing of tension by Professor Solomon Simmons. Everyone, and I'm very grateful to the um, uh, organizers of the Ministry of Unification uh, for giving us this opportunity to talk. Um, I do have a set of slides, and I'll quickly work through those. If we could go to the next slide. Um, oh, maybe. Should I do myself? I'm happy to do if we. Is it possible to do? Does it work? Yeah. Um, yes, I think so, yeah. So um, let me begin with the discussion of um, the, the, with a simile. So I'm, I'm from the Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution, and I'm so happy to see all the students here today, uh, because it's in the students that we're going to see the possibility for peace moving down the road. Uh, it is, uh, uh, of course, the people who make the conflict uh, live in tension but they're leaving a world behind them for the, the, the students that come after. I wanted to begin with a simile. Uh, that is a, uh, a, something that's like something else. So at the Carter School, and at, for a peace and conflict resolution point of view, what's important is the idea that conflict is the same at different levels of analysis. So that means that conflict can happen um, on one level between spouses, that is a husband and wife, and it can be similar to what happens between countries, that is countries that are estranged. So the simile is that rival countries are like estranged spouses. So we want to speak here today about uh, green detente. So what is green detente? Uh, green detente is a policy agenda pursued by a government, but it's very vague in a certain way. And what is it concretely? What it is concretely is a narrative. It is an attempt to shift the narrative. We at the Carter School are starting what's called the narrative transformation uh, lab. And there we're trying to change the shape of the story, that is to transform the story. So the Green Detente is an attempt to change the shape of the story. So building on that insight, what does a narrative entail? A narrative has a protagonist, the science of storytelling teaches us. It has a protagonist and an antagonist. It has a beginning, a middle, and end. And most importantly for this case, it has a set of dramatic stakes. That is something is at stake Think about why it is you watch so many uh, streaming television shows and movies. Why do you go back again and again to these things? It's because they have dramatic stakes, 
something hangs on it, and something very important hangs on this conflict in the Korean Peninsula. And so what we want to do is I want to bring forward a way of thinking about the kinds of narratives that are relevant here and what we might do if we're ever to have hope that there'll be a change from this situation which has been one of the worst conflicts in the world uh, for so many decades. Um, there are so many reasons to be critical of uh, President Donald Trump. I won't go into those. But one of the interesting things about Donald Trump um, it, is that he understood something about narrative. And what he, what he f put forward, if you, if you uh, go back to his uh, uh, rather odd conversations um, with, with, uh, about North Korea, he said that uh, he was really tough and that he, uh, he, was, he was engaged in this, uh, th this relationship with the Korean leader, but that he wrote him uh, beautiful letters and that they were love letters. So there's something strange about that. And, I, and here I have the Iran, a former Iranian foreign minister who says that foreign policy is not about, uh, uh, about love or feelings. It is about respecting one's commitment. So here is a gap. What's the gap between this? On some level, Donald Trump understood something that the Iranian foreign minister did not do and made one of the few breakthroughs in this conflict that we've ever seen. So what's going on here? Has anyone ever heard of love languages? Has you ever taken a quiz? Anyone show of hands? Any people? Yeah, see the, the young people who know exactly what I'm talking about. So what are love languages? It's a way of thinking about how husbands and wives or spouses um, fight. Why do they keep fighting for so many years? Why do they love each other and know each other so well, but they keep fighting? Uh, and what this author has done and made very popular is introduced the notion of love language. So what's a stereotypical example? On one side, let's say a stereotypical husband uh, has the love language where he likes to be praised for what he's done and contributed to the marriage. Uh, he has a love language of kind words. And he comes home and wants to be flattered for the things he's done. But the stereotypical wife has a different love language of shared service and, and shared time uh, to the household. And so what she wants is she wants him to cook with her or to spend time or to disclose his feelings to her and what have you. And, they, and what happens is invariably they fight. They speak different love languages. When they try to resolve the conflict, they can't do it. Why? They, is this, they speak different languages. Okay? So if you don't understand English, unless you have a translator, you won't understand me now and vice versa. In the same way, the love language metaphor speaks to that. Well, what about nations? How do nations work? They don't speak different love languages, although Donald Trump oddly suggested they did. They speak different justice languages. That is, when they speak about justice and injustice, they mean different things. How do they know that they have respect for their uh, foreign policy and for their sovereignty? They know it by the language of justice that, uh, that is the one that they tend to speak naturally. So the argument I'm going to make is the North and the South uh, of the Koreas speak different love languages. Okay, that's going to be the argument that I make, and I've written a book about this called Root Narrative Theory that helps us to understand what those, love langu what those justice languages are. Let me briefly just uh, con convey them here because I can't go too deep into them here. Um, but what you have here is the basic, love the basic justice language. You have an Egyptian obelisk, and I was speaking with my Chinese colleagues the other day about what is the American uh, uh, language of justice and the concept that it brings to bear to think about itself. Well, we have this, why do all the Western capitals have an obelisk like this from Egypt? They do so because they're trying to develop an existential language of security and identity that goes all the way back to the Nile Delta. Uh, but this is only the language of security. Um, it's not, it's based on the notion of insecurity, and the obelisk represents imperial or state or kingly power, the ability to be sovereign in itself. So security comes from the notion of insecurity. You need a protagonist and an antagonist in stakes. But that's not the only language. So we heard earlier about the language of liberty. And how do we get the notion of liberty? Here's the French Revolution represented. We speak in French about détente. Uh, the, 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 the French Revolution was only a, a statement about liberty. There was another revolution in the Soviet Union that was anchored in a different concept, a different villain, if you will, which was economic power. And then finally, in our, um, our own times, we've seen uh, rebellions against cultural power, uh, prejudice, bigotry, and abuse. But all of these have a, a negative and positive view, and we get the different languages of, of liberty, equality, and dignity from them. So those are four different love languages, I mean, justice languages. What about the United States? Well, we have the biggest obelisk of them all. Have you ever been to the United States in Washington, D.C.? You see the Washington Monument. What does it represent? It represents security and a fundamental sense, existential security, which all nations require. And this is one way to represent it on a very symbolic level. Uh, but of course, the United States is known for freedom. 
Thomas Jefferson is the, is the, is the, the great uh, uh, hero of freedom, and individual liberty against the state. Um, this idea, we also have, a, if you go over on the tidal basin in the United States, you'll also see there's another monument to the fight for equality. And then recently, Martin Luther King represents the fight for dignity. These, again, are four different justice languages. Each has a different villain to the story. Each has a different conception of the protagonist. We see them all here. Uh, and if you speak the, the justice language of one to the other party, they will not understand you. And you will lead to conflicts invariably. And even the, and more contact and encounter will not solve your problem because you simply speak different justice languages in the same way that a husband and wife who know each other better than anyone else keep getting into the same old fight again and again. So what about the North and the South of Korea? Well, what are these ICBMs for? Why the missiles? Why do they keep doing this? Well, I, I think symbolically there's something interesting here. If you think about the ICBM or the missile almost as an obelisk, as a kind of representation of the existential identity uh, uh, that we will always be here. You will never dislodge us. There will never be regime change. I think this is the symbolic message. It's a language, it, and if you read it through the language, and you see it and hear it in the language, through the language of stability, of security, you understand what's being done. Uh, this happens in other parts of the world. I mentioned Iran earlier. We see that the Iranians, too, cling to their, their, their sovereignty in a way which seems irrational. It doesn't seem to be good for the people. It seems to undermine them. We see this in Iran. We also see it in rogue, other rogue nations like in East Africa. Uh, the, the nation of Eritrea is an example, who, uh, who keeps fighting against the language of human rights and individual freedom, even though their people are impoverished in ways that they would not be if they would just give in and they would simply accept the international regime. They will not do so and they will don't, won't do so because they, their language of justice is different from the one that we speak about freedom. So if you speak about freedom to a regime concerned about its existential identity, it will always speak back to you in the language of security. So what could we do? Um, I've always been con con uh, uh, um, uh, con interested in this poet, um, this Korean poet, and I'm no expert in Korean uh, history, but Jung Mung Ju is this interesting uh, case for me. And the reason why I found it so interesting is, in a way, he represents a paradox. He's a member of, a, of an old uh, 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 dynasty, and he's replaced by this sort of stable dynasty, and yet somehow this poem says something about uh, an inter-Korean identity, uh, the notion of something that bridges, there's something about loyalty. It speaks in the language, I believe, of security, and, and does so in a very visceral, emotional way. The most important thing about narrative is that it speaks not only to the head, but also to the heart at the same time. And so you have to speak the language of the heart to be able to reach the other side. This is an example of what I think could be done, what we might call ritual or mythical practice, to work on the level indirectly where you build a sense of, of, of what I would call existential identity and security so that there's some possibility for these little moves like the one around uh, the, the dam and water release that we've been talking about. So it's so important to be able to work, the, to situate those specific policy objectives in a larger narrative context. So how can we move forward? Uh, it can't simply be about strategic communication. Often when we talk about communications and narrative, it's about how do we win? How do we make them change? A moral a perspective, the moral imagination says, we need to change too. We, and by we, I don't just mean South Korea, I mean the United States that we have to recognize that there are things that we have done in this conflict that were not good, there are ways in which we've tried to impose ourselves on the other side, not to take the blame for things that were done wrong to us or, or in other, and on the other side, but to recognize that we have to engage in a deeper way and speak one another's language. Exactly on the analogy of a spouse, two spouses who are fighting one another and who can't get beyond and trying to divorce, but they can't divorce. The thing about a husband and wife, they can divorce. The North and the South cannot divorce. They have to always live next to one another. It requires, uh, it requires sincerity in this, in this extension of imagination. Uh, the policy um, must work in that justice language. And, and the, the, this is most critical, I think, here. Any sense, remember how well the parties know each other. They know every detail. They know every little thing that what it means in their own translation. And so what happens is they can smell very quickly if there's, a, if there's insincerity. And you, if, for example, if you're trying to speak the language of freedom, uh, and, and, and what they need to hear is the language of security, um, they will 
uh, they will know that, and it will be difficult to move it forward. So this is not an easy thing I'm suggesting, but if green detente as a, a strategy of narrative transformation will work, it's going to have to have something like this in place. And finally, the notion of win-win. So what's different about conflict resolution, for peace and conflict resolution, is that we always try to win-win. You always try to make sure that both sides have some kind of outcome which is not consistency with the specific position they're interested in, but with the deeper interests and needs of the parties. In this case, I'm saying the needs of the parties, both parties require security. Uh, right now, the South is very, uh, sees the value of freedom. We, saw it, we see this in economic development. But the North does not yet see the value of freedom. In fact, only sees the threat and regime change. So in that sense, you try win-win. You realize it can't always work. You have to be tough and you have to be smart, but you also have to have a short memory and you have to be able to forgive. And this is the language we learned from the, from the language, from the studies of cooperation, uh, that are the famous studies of cooperation, where tit for tat, moving back and forth, trying to move toward a common objective is important. So just to close, uh, nations are like spouses. Uh, conflict has invariant properties. Uh, things that work at the level of a husband and wife fighting can also work in international relations quite different, obviously, but there are certain principles implied. The warring parties speak different languages, effectively, uh, metaphorically. If you want to work forward, you cannot simply repeat your own message and hope that the other side will hear it. They simply will never hear it, and therefore, if you want to change the shape of the story, you have to learn how stories work. Thank you very much. Yes, a ago, Sunim. Thank you very much, Professor Simmons. So that was very philosophical and also linguistically uh, very important for us to remember as well. So states are like spouses and of course husband and wife, they love each other but they speak different languages. So And also perhaps there can be lack of deep understanding of each other which could lead to conflict. So as the husband and wife uh, or to love each other, then what we need is sincerity and imagination and deeper understanding of the interest of each other. In other words, we also need to put each other's, put ourselves in each other's shoes, I would say. Next, we have the speaker with us on the stage already, uh, Dr. Mats Engman from the Institute for Security and Development Policy will talk about reduction of tension and resolution of conflicts between South and North Korea through the promotion of green detente, visions and strategies. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you today. I'm deeply honored to do so. Um, I have four main areas I would like to discuss with you today. Uh, first, I'd like to take a quick look back on some of the overall strategic situation and draw some conclusions that I think are important for the development on the peninsula. Second, to discuss some conditions that I believe need to be met to make the Green Detente Initiative doable. And third, some security-related constraints and last, a few remarks on how to engage the outside world. Overall, an attempt to address how to move forward rather than look back. I'm a practitioner, so I will share my perspective, what I think needs to be done more on the ground to pave the way for a reduction of tension on the Korean Peninsula using this initiative. So that's my structure for the uh, presentation. So some observation on the strategic uh, security situation. Um, it's not uh, unfamiliar to any one of you that we experience in this part of the world a rather high tension. And there are several critical conflicts. The US-China rivalry, the issues around the South China Sea, the Taiwan Straits, and the Korean Peninsula in itself. And there is an increased risk, I would argue, that we have spillover effects to, from, and between these potential conflicts area. And one conclusion that I draw from this is that development on the Korean Peninsula is not just an interest and a concern for the two Koreas. The war in Ukraine, the ongoing war in Ukraine, and the recently concluded Chinese Communist Party 20th Conference 
has reduced predictability of where China is heading, and it has increased the likelihood for an authoritarian axis between Russia and China. And North Korea is likely to benefit from such an axis. So conclusion two, sanctions on North Korea are not working as designed and hope, and the recent flurry of missile tests, I think, is a clear indication that sanctions are not working. Even if we don't like maybe to admit that, North Korea, at least from a military perspective and from a planner's perspective, is a nuclear-capable nation. And I don't think North Korea is in any hurry to change. So conclusion three, that we need to focus still on deterrence defensive action, but however, we need something new, something different, and we need to develop measures and proposals that are meaningful for North Korea, and we need a well-thought risk reduction and crisis management strategy. And meeting some of the conditions and prerequisites for the Green Detente Initiative, the stated objective, as I understand, with the initiative is that it, I quote, aims to ease tension between North and South through dialogue and normalized inter-Korean relations under the principle of reciprocity and pragmatism, end of quote. The policy, as I understand it, focused both of green, which is the et ecological environmental aspect and measures, and also the detente, which is more directed towards security, risk reduction, and confidence building. And my focus today is on the latter. As someone who has spent almost two years of my life in the middle of the DMC, having my office 100 meters from the military demarcation line, and experienced first time several incidents, including some where weapons were fired, I very much welcome new proposals to address the security challenges and the risks on the peninsula and in the DMC. And I would like to look closer into some of these underpinning conditions or prerequisites that I believe need to be addressed and hopefully met to make the initiative into a viable and sustainable project. A very recent paper from June of this year from the Korea Institute for Natural Unification examines the Green Detent Initiative and lists three conditions or prerequisites that need to be met. And I would like to examine these a little bit closer. And I've added a fourth at the end, which is my own. So on the slide there, you can see the government of the two Korea, which is the first uh, condition, must have the will to resume talks. The second one is about the North Korea should actively engage with the international community and the international community should ex exercise flexibility in its engagement with North Korea. And the third argument is that the South Korean government needs to pursue a paradigm shift, acting as a stakeholder or partner and recognizing the importance of the international community. And the condition I've added is, I think we need to have a very long-term perspective with continuity and endurance. So what can we do in order to try to address and change these conditions in the right uh, direction? My first is to, to catch on a little bit what uh, uh, was said in the previous presentation about the value in the importance of communication. I think we need to explore and promote more communication between the two Koreas using a multitude of formats and platforms and content. Maybe this could start with more verbal and message traffic at the very lowest level, like using the hotlines between the Freedom House and the North Korean counterpart as well as the existing lines in the two transport corridors east and west, and gradually increase the level as North Korea becomes more accepting. Since, since we also have seen and heard that North Korea is seeking international assistance in areas like medical support and water management, I believe the South Korean government to advocate on behalf of North Korea without being directive in nature and not highlighting shortcomings, but rather stressing the situation requires international community's attention and assistance. 
And I think South Korea should funnel assistance through international agencies rather than offering bilateral assistance. Number three, what happens on the peninsula is directly linked to the overall regional development and security situation and the inherent risk, as I mentioned, of spillover effects. So I believe the government here in South Korea need to pay equal attention to reduce regional tension, being proactive and ready and willing to take initiatives, and any such initiatives need to be carefully coordinated with the United States. Initiatives to develop risk reduction Measures, procedures, arms control agreements, and confidence building could be part of such an initiative, trying to break the current spiral of provocations and countermeasures. And if possible, I believe any initiative that aims to improve inter-Korean relations would very much benefit from clear bipartisan support and a long-term perspective. My bottom line being that it's line is that we need to recognize what is important to the Kim regime and develop initiatives and maintain and measures that are meaningful also for North Korea. Or in other words, uh, according to the famous strategist uh, von Clausewitz, try to find North Korea's center of gravity. Some security concerns. Examining the situation in the DMC, I think it's safe to say that the DMC is viewed as a symbol of division among Korean people, both in the south and in the north. However, it's also important security environmental related aspects, making practical aspects of the careful management of the DMC and its resources important and beneficial to both Koreas. Maintaining the armistice agreement is important for several reasons. First, although North Korea does not always abide by all of the provisions in the agreement, they staunchly abide by and recognize the DMC and the military demarcation line as a mechanism for keeping opposing military forces separated. The DMC also forced an impregnable security barrier along the southern portion of North Korea. And this is something they are not likely to agree to open up readily. This being the case, it's important that any new initiative is not jeopardizing the agreement or may be used as an excuse by North Korea to increase tension in the DMC. And for the South Korean government, it would be important to continue to observe the provisions in the agreement, fully respect the role of the United Nations Command, and coordinate any initiative related to the DMC with the United Nations Command, who is the guardian of the armistice agreement. Paving the way for any initiative in the DMC, a demining effort in part of the DMC and gradually removing weapons and guard posts are programs that will reduce tension and potentially prevent conflicts. And one recommendation is that the South Korean government should intensify work with appropriate international agencies, the United Nations, the United Nations Command, and the sending states within the United Nations Command to develop a program for landmine removal at an appropriate time. To have a ready program once the conditions have improved. I also believe an international-led demining project could be viewed as less intrusive by North Korea. Another important initiative is to have the military demarcation line correctly and safely delineated and marked. Currently existing maps and markers in the terrain are both inaccurate and many markers are not easily visible. This contributes to uncertainties and risks of incidents. Using modern geospatial technology, an effort was made in the time period 2014 and 16 to have the MDL correctly delineated. Efforts to restart this program and to gain the approval of both governments to make an updated delineation of the MDL is absolutely a forerunner to any programs to remove 
demolitions, minefields, wire entanglements, and other hazards to the safe movement in the DMC in accordance with paragraph 13 alpha of the Armistice Agreement. Outreach or socializing green detente. It's already been mentioned today, um, the importance of the international community, and I like to use the word socializing the green detente initiative. This conference goes some way to do this, but I believe it will be important to promote the initiative and maybe even more important to have more nations and organizations to support and market the initiative. The DMC is through the construct of the armistice already an agreement of international concern and obligation. Using this as a force multiplier to attract more shareholders in the future activity could potentially be of significance. Using track 1.0 and track 2 meetings among these groups could be important to preclude misinterpretations and misunderstandings. To conclude, looking back at history, we know periods of dialogue and progress in inter-Korean relations have been possible. Even if the current situation is very difficult, and even minor progress seems close to impossible, having a long-term and persistent perspective is important. Develop clear ideas, formulate clear and concrete proposals, and be proactive in promoting these ideas among a family of friendly nations. Reduces risks of misunderstanding and misinterpretation. Initiate more joint research related to the Greed and Taunt Initiative. Preserve the Armistice Agreement and continue effort on risk reduction. Be prepared to use different formats and different ways to promote these ideas. I'd like to end with a quote from the former Israeli Prime Minister, Mr. Ben-Gurion, who said, to be a realist, you need to believe in the miracles. Thank you. Yeah, much, uh Thank you very much uh, for your remarks. He talked about the DMZ, and he himself had an experience of working in the DMZ for about two years. And based on that experience, a team mining project or delineation project uh, were the, uh, the ideas that were put forward by the speaker uh, so that we can mobilize a broader uh, international community in supporting our initiative. Thank you very much. And now we will be hearing about the Israeli experience of peace building from Ambassador Akiva Tor. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to speak at this uh, conference. So I'm, going not, I'm actually not going to speak about the Korean Peninsula so much. I'm going to speak about Israel's border regions and try to understand uh, although Israel is much smaller, but we have a lot of border regions, more border regions in Korea. Can we learn some lessons here about both challenges and opportunities? Well, first of all, it's not 100% certain that we should learn from each other. After all, Israel and Korea are very far distant. We share completely different geostrategic orientations. Korea is in Northeast Asia. Israel is in the Middle East. Uh, for Korea, the Indo-Pacific is the wider region. For Israel, it's the wider Middle East, North Africa, and then afterwards Europe. Uh, but nevertheless, we share values, and we share a strong uh, strategic and values relationship with the United States. Also, we don't share uh, history, ethnicity, or language, but uh, we do share a text uh, for large minority of Koreans, uh, Christians, we share the Hebrew Bible, which is a source of values and a way of looking at history. Finally, the Israel-Arab conflict and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is primarily a national conflict. It's a conflict between competing nationalisms or competing peoples, whereas the Korean conflict is essentially a civil war. So there are many differences. However, one thing we do share, our conflicts were both fueled and amplified by superpower Cold War competition. 
a few words about the, the Jewish people and how we are similar to the Korean people. We're very ancient. We're not as ancient as the Koreans. We're only 3,000 years, Hebrew-speaking Semites. Uh, but uh, I think uh, one thing which is similar is that we both have a very strong sense of our anti antiquity and an appreciation of uh, the strength of our culture. The Jews were dispersed around the world. We didn't stay in our land like the Koreans from 135 AD when the uh, Great Revolt was suppressed by Rome. Uh, the Jews were dispersed all around the world. And uh, today, the majority of Jews actually, or the largest Jewish community actually lives in Israel, but the Jewish people are divided. Half are in Israel and half are outside of Israel. But like Korea, uh, we took nation state form. In our modern form, we regained our sovereignty and our independence in 1948. So we're different and similar. But now let's uh, uh, also, by the way, we're also uh, both countries which uh, went through great trauma in the 20th century before we regained our sovereignty. The state of Israel is about one-fifth the size of Korea, but other than that, it's very similar because also our population is one-fifth that of Korea. I think the one big difference between the Israeli situation and the Korean situation is that Israel has absolutely no strategic depth. If you look at Israel's narrow waistline, uh, separating the uh, western border of the West Bank and the Mediterranean Ocean is only 15 kilometers. And that's actually in Israel's most uh, populated region. The West Bank is only seven kilometers from uh, Israel's international airport, Ben Gurion. So in Israel, there's no opportunity or possibility of retreat to the Busan perimeter. We can't retreat at all. At the same time, I would say that both countries very much share a sense of proximity, a sense of being close to the border. As, you feel, as we feel here, sitting in this hall not far from the DMZ, and uh, your capital is also very close. So we're unusual countries, by the way, in the sense that uh, uh, we have a sense of proximity to a hostile border. Now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to share just a few um, examples from Israel's situation. See, maybe there's a lesson that we can learn. The first I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a short story about the good fence, uh, which was... Not in, it was an Israeli policy on its northern border with Lebanon between uh, 1978 and the year 2000. Uh, Lebanon devolved into a very extreme civil war beginning from 1975, which took more 10 to 15 years. Uh, Israel was not involved in that civil war, but it very much affected us because Palestinian guerrillas came from Jordan, Destabilized, uh, uh, destabilized Lebanon and began to, to attack Israel's northern border. Uh, and Israel decided to try to strengthen a buffer zone between ourselves and the rest of Lebanon by opening a gate to the south through which South Lebanese, uh, Maronite Christians, but also Shiites and also Druze could enter into, enter into Israel to work, to receive medical care, even to receive mail. Uh, basically, we wanted to try to develop a zone which would have resources, which would be in a better humanitarian situation, and would be a buffer between us and the rest of Lebanon. Well, to a large extent, it looked like this, and uh, to a large extent it worked, but then it stopped working. It stopped working in the year 2000 when Israel withdrew from its own military presence in the security zone, because, uh, uh, because of the collapse of the Christian populations in southern Lebanon and their ability to defend themselves and the radicalization of the Shiite populations there. In other words, Hezbollah became the dominant force. The lesson here I think that we have to learn is that the good fence, which was an attempt to strengthen and build a friendly buffer area on Israel's northern border, could not prevail against much deeper military and political developments in the region, such as the strengthening of Hezbollah and its domina domination of the Shiite uh, leadership. 
But we have a more recent example, which is actually uh, working a little bit better, and that's the Israeli-Lebanon Maritime Agreement, which was just recently concluded in October 2022. Basically, Lebanon and Israel have no diplomatic relations, and we're technically enemy states. Uh, uh, Hezbollah dominates Le Lebanon militarily and politically, and that's more or less the reason, because we don't have any real issues between our states. The maritime border between Israel and Lebanon had no significance, really, until uh, the discovery recently of large amounts of undersea natural gas. And the Lebanese economy is in crisis. It is in deep need of this gas. So all of a sudden, we actually have something which is joining us, two states which are in enemy relations. Nevertheless, there's a need to exploit a natural resource, uh, which is essential for the Lebanese economy and beneficial for the Israeli economy because we also have natural gas in the region. But we can only do it if we come to some sort of working agreement between us. Uh, the agreement was negotiated with active U.S. mediation. Israel agreed to uh, Lebanese exploitation of the Kana field with payment of, I'm sorry for the mistake in the slide, 17.5% of the royalties. Lebanon refused to actually sign the agreement together with Israel. It was signed in a separate room. But the letters of accession to the agreement were deposited with the United States as a guarantor. So this is an example of something happening on a maritime border where we don't actually make peace, but pressing economic needs caused us to reach an agreement. If, heaven forbid, the kind of field fails, I hope that maybe the agreement will fall through. I would, I I would hope that that would not happen. Uh, another example, I think, which is very similar to the Korean example, is the Ares Industrial Zone on the Gaza border. The Gaza border uh, is, uh, Israel is not there. It's ruled by Hamas. But uh, we tried for many years to run an industrial zone outside of Gaza in order, so it, basically it was companies which were set up with Israeli capital, and um, Palestinian laborers would come in, and it would bring uh, money and resources for Gaza so that, the, so that the living standard could be raised there. And despite occasional terror attacks within the zone and regional tensions, hundreds of factories were active for decades, employing thousands of Palestinians. But following the outbreak of the Second Intifada, also in the year 2000, and uh, shelling of the region, the companies, the Israeli companies, basically left, and uh, running the zone was no longer tenable. And errors fell apart. However, it's something that we would like to renew, even though Gaza is for us very much an enemy state. I think there's something here which is reminiscent of the Korean experience in Gaza. Israel-Jordan peace agreement, and this is my last example. Israel, Jordan, uh, the Kingdom of Jordan was the second country with which Israel reached a comprehensive uh, peace treaty. It resolved all issues of territory, security, consular issues, governance, even the status of the King of Jordan in Jerusalem. But a very important part of the agreement was a water protocol uh, and, uh, and an agreement about future water co cooperation because we are living in very, very arid region. According to the Israel-Jordan Peace Agreement, which was signed in 1994, Israel provides Jordan 50 million cubic meters of water annually. And Jordan has a right to 75% of the Yarmouk River. And we also agree that we will help each other to endure droughts and will use desalination technology to generate new sources of water. Uh, now, we've kept to that agreement, and we've kept to that agreement strictly, even in cases where Israel did not have enough water. We always gave the water that we required because peace agreement has to be, has to be respected. Then this led to another idea, which is actually didn't actually work. That was the Red Dead Canal. That was supposed to be a canal between the Red Sea and the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest place on Earth, minus 431 uh, meters. And the idea was that a canal would be, uh, uh, would be dug. Uh, water would come from the Red Sea, would flow into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is sinking because we're not allowing fresh water to go into it. We need that fresh water for ourselves. Uh, but 
in the end, it, it didn't work because of science. Uh, it didn't produce enough hydroelectric electricity, and we began to become worried about what would happen if the water from the Red Sea would actually go into the Dead Sea. We had some sort of experiments that seemed to show that the Dead Sea might turn red and begin to smell. Since it's a UNESCO tre tre uh, treasure, we didn't, we didn't want that to happen. However, we've managed to do something else. Just now at COP27, Israel, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates signed a new memorandum of understanding for peace and prosperity. Basically, it says that Jordan will build 600 megawatts of solar power capacity for export to Israel. United Arab Emirates will finance this solar power construction. And Israel will provide water, scarce Jordan, with 200 million cubic meters of desalinated water annually. That's four times more than what we had from the peace treaty. In other words, the peace treaty has now led to five times the amount of fresh water for Jordan. It works because of this. Jordan has a lot of sun, and uh, Israel is on the Mediterranean and knows how to build desalination plants. It kind of looks like this. So what I wanted to say in summing up is the following. Uh, a border region can be developed and can be stabilizing for mutual benefit, but the following points have to be noted. One, there must be strong political will on both sides to maintain the peace. Two, there has to be strong political ability to govern. In other words, this is something that Israel can do with Jordan, which is a functioning government, but which we can't do with Lebanon, which is not a functioning government. The governments have to be committed to their commitments, and Israel maintained its water commitments even when it was very difficult. The economic benefit must be real and essential. In other words, scarcity of resource can be an opportunity for peace. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ambassador. So the case of Israel, as he has mentioned, yes, it borders with six countries, and it had been filled with tension and conflicts, and that is why the buffer zone or the cultural projects and also the industrial zone. So there have been a number of initiatives and efforts and some of them fell through or had to be abandoned for various reasons. But still, Israel always tried to pursue peace, for example, signing peace treaty with neighboring countries. So thank you very much for sharing your experience, which also gives a lot of implications to Korea as well. Okay. The last speaker of the session is Professor uh, Nishino Junya from Keio University of Japan. Uh, can you now join us online? Yes, uh, you can go ahead, Mr. Junya. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Nishino Junya uh, from Keio University of Japan. It is regrettable that I cannot join you in person today, but I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this invitation. Today, I would like to talk about peace on the Korean Peninsula and how Korea and Japan, as well as Korea, US, and Japan can work together to promote peace on the peninsula. Uh, first, regarding the Green Detente, which is a theme of today's forum, I thought about the concept myself as a political scientist myself. Uh, when I hear the word Green Detente, this is what comes to my mind. First, the word Detente uh, came about in the 1970s. Uh, as it relates to the eased tension between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And in that regard, uh, for us to be able to go towards the detente, there should be balanced power in terms of military. That is something that you need, first and foremost. In the 1970s, the U.S. and the former Soviet Union reached nuclear balance in terms of nuclear weapons, and that was how they were able to achieve detente. But uh, the power balance is not enough. You need a communication and dialogue. You need 
a communication dialogue on the basis of the balance of power. That was how the two countries back then were able to achieve detente. But today we are talking about green detente. Green uh, is uh, a word that we need to pay greater attention to because it's not about the political arena that we are talking about. It's about the climate change or infectious diseases and other non-political areas where the two Koreas can work together. That's my understanding of the word green. Uh, military stabilization, uh, communication dialogue, all three elements should come together to be able to achieve green detente in my view. But if you look at the situation on the Korean Peninsula today, to our regret, the military balance is being broken and communication and dialogue are absent. There is no cooperation in the political domain. To realize green detente, I already talked about the prerequisites. Uh, we need to restore military balance, the balance of military power, so to speak. And at the same time, on the Korean Peninsula, we need to maintain an, a stable order and need to achieve a proactive uh, peace on the peninsula. Uh, those are the efforts that we need to make to realize Green Day Tang Te. From that perspective, I thought about the role that Japan could play. Basically, uh, Japan is not a party to the Korean Peninsula issues. The party to the Korean Peninsula matters are the two Koreas, and we are in a position to be able to support the Korean efforts. The Prime Minister Kishida is pursuing his own diplomatic initiative, and I would like to go over that uh, before talking about what we can do in Japan to support the efforts on the Korean Peninsula. Prime Minister Kishida, during the Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, put forward his own diplomatic initiative uh, that's called the Kishida Vision for Peace, uh, consisting of five elements. The first is the free and open Indo-Pacific. The second, a strengthening a security guarantee. Third element is to realize a world without nuclear weapons. Fourth, the reform of the United Nations functions. And fifth element uh, is uh, international collaboration for economic security. These are the five elements that uh, consist of the Kishida vision. And to apply this framework to the Korean Peninsula uh, issue, uh, that is as related to the free and open in the Pacific. And Japan will be stepping up its defense capabilities. And, and the third element is related to the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. And the fourth element is the reform of the United Nations, which means that reinforcing uh, of the multilateral framework. And the fifth element is related to economic security, which would place a focus on supply chain issues. So from all these perspectives, how, what are the roles that Japan can play and what are the roles that Japan is currently playing? To talk about those first, uh, we can think about revitalization of a, the tripartite cooperation between among uh, Korea, the US, and Japan with the launch of the Yoon suk yeol administration. I believe that at all levels, dialogue and communication is taking place between Korea and Japan and also involving the US. We can also think about the tripartite partnership in defense as well. For instance, uh, there was a ballistic missile defense training and anti-submarine training as well as the ballistic missile training that took place more recently as well. And last week, the three leaders of the three countries uh, were able to issue a joint statement. And prior to that, there was a joint statement that was issued by the three uh, foreign minister ministers of the countries regarding the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula uh, and also involving support for the audacious initi initiative of the, of the current uh, president of Korea and also regularizing foreign ministers' meeting among three countries. 
uh, to put into action the spirit of this joint statement is something that Japan, I think, can do at this moment. Lastly, uh, to be more specific, uh, currently, security cooperation uh, between among the U.S., Korea, and Japan are being reactivated. If you look at the joint statement of the three leaders that came out last week, uh, they are going to share more actively intelligence information regarding security. At the same time, uh, for this trilateral cooperation, uh, building trust uh, between among these three countries is important, and this is something that is currently ongoing. And information exchange is something that is currently being uh, is currently taking place as well. But. If you look at this joint statement, uh, you may get an impression that the focus is placed very much on the defense aspect. As we move forward, uh, we will have to engage not only in cooperation for defense and deterrence, but also uh, pursue engagement so that we can induce North Korea to come to the negotiating table for talks. Thankfully, the Yoon Song Yeol administration, um, when the president attended uh, the AS Korea ASEAN summit, he himself put forward his own Indo Pacific strategy. So the Korean government will focus not only on defense and deterrence, but also uh, make a greater contribution to maintaining a stable order in the Indo Pacific. So that is another area where the two governments can t work together. And I understand that there is a booklet that's published regarding the Yoon government's North Korean policy. It's been about half a year since the launch of the new government in Korea. The US, Korea, and Japan should work together beyond the area of defense and deterrence uh, and engaging greater efforts to uh, pursue dialogue with North Korea. I think uh, they're ready to do so. And from Prime Minister Kishida's perspective, uh, realizing a world without nuclear weapons uh, is uh, one of the main pillars of his policy. And next year, Japan will be a host uh, to G7. And when they meet at the leader's level, I understand that Kishida, Prime Minister Kishida, is ready to put forward a clearer vision regarding a nuclear-free world. And in, on that front, I look forward to having partnership among the three countries as well. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And also, thank you for joining us via online. The Kishida a government uh, is trying to pursue a world without nuclear weapons. Uh, that is something that the entire, wor entire world can agree on, especially when it comes to peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, Professor Junya talked about the importance of security as well as the equally important aspect of communication and dialogue with North Korea. Uh, to help achieve Green Day Tang Te, you've made many suggestions. Uh, thank you very much. Originally, we were supposed to end by 12.15. Uh, we have just about five minutes left until the end of the session. I'm not sure whether we will be able to use a little more time than five minutes. We finished listening to all five speakers and to try to summarize all of their presentations myself. Currently, the inter-Korean relations are at a grave stage. As you may be well aware, the DPRK has fired a series of ICBMs, and it is trying to uh, raise tension on the Korean Peninsula by using its force and power. Uh, still, we have to move towards peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. And these efforts, as was mentioned by the Israeli ambassador, uh, is uh, could carry forward in the future. We've made many efforts, uh, such as setting up an industrial complex in North Korea and uh, promoting tourism. But many failures have taken place. But despite all those 
failed attempts, we our efforts still continue. Our efforts uh, should be patient and should be based on a long-term perspective. And we also need to engage in communication and dialogue based on our sincerity. Towards that end, between the two Koreas, we need a dialogue channel. Uh, but at the same time, we could utilize 1.5 track channel for communication. And we could also utilize international agencies or organizations. As you must be well aware, um, response to climate change is a global challenge. Uh, and Green Detente initiative on the Korean Peninsula uh, is uh, indeed very relevant for the global efforts uh, to respond to climate change. And this is, again, will be able to contribute to promoting peace on the Korean Peninsula at the same time. In the DMZ, there are about 100 species, rare species of flora and fauna. And I understand that more than 2,700 species of flora and, and fauna uh, currently can be found in the DMZ, which uh, presents a unique ecological perspective. So uh, even for that, uh, from that perspective, it should be preserved and protected. Uh, there have been many suggestions and propose, proposals that have been put forward by the Korean government um, regarding the development of the DMZ. Especially, there was a proposal to register the DMZ as an ecological uh, reserve under the UN framework. Uh, and there were many more concrete and specific initiatives regarding the development of the DMZ. Uh, however, the North Koreans have not responded to any of such uh, proposals. Uh, if North Korea uh, were to cooperate with us on the, those initiatives, uh, they might uh, think uh, that the division on the Korean Peninsula might become more entrenched. That's their logic, which is difficult for us to understand. But regarding the international peace zone efforts and so forth, I believe that, believe that our work should continue on. We've had five presenters today, and I would like to ask five presenters uh, to uh, give one piece of advice uh, for the realization of the Green Detente. Uh, let me call out Professor Park first. Uh, what would be your one piece of advice for Green Detente? Thank you. I was able to listen to all of the other presentations, and I enjoyed them very much. And this came to my mind. Uh, to put emphasis on just one thing, this is uh, what it, it would be. I told you previously that uh, international elements come to play when it comes to the matters regarding the Korean Peninsula. But given the North Korean issue, some of the issues that should be addressed at the bilateral level, others at the multilateral level. And maybe that may not be true any longer these days. But uh, regarding certain uh, issues, uh, North Korea used to or pursue this policy of trying to directly communicate with the U.S. instead of engaging with the South Korean government, uh, depending on issues that they are dealing with. Uh, regarding the development of the DMZ into a green peace zone, I believe that this is something that requires multilateral efforts, maybe uh, trying to find a breakthrough or encouraging North Korea to, uh, to develop an interest in the project. Maybe that is something that we can pursue at the bilateral level. However, because this is something that is related to the ecological system, as well, and for it to become a large-scale project, we need international involvement. The U.S. and China are important international actors uh, when it comes to the matters of the Korean Peninsula. However, the North Korean issue is highly sensitive uh, in those two countries. And exactly for that reason, um, their involvement uh, might not be all that effective or efficient. But there could be other actors, such as the European Union, who are not as sensitive 
politically to the North Korean issue. And at the same time, Canada could be another example of an international actor who could take part in this initiative uh, involving the DMZ project. And they could also make a contribution to increasing efficiency of bilateral and multilateral engagement with North Korea. So that's one thing that I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. And then Professor Solomon Simmons. If I had one piece of advice about what to do to make the green detente effort successful, I would say that any action that is taken concretely by the South Korean government, any action has to fit the North Korean story. That is, the action has to match the story. If it doesn't match the story, in particular with a rogue regime who doesn't need to be attentive to international pressure, in, in part in precisely because they are inattentive to international pressure, the, 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 diff, the disconnect between actions and stories become uh, dangerous. So, for example, uh, the release of floodwaters should be linked to the story of the stability of the, the North Korean state. And as uncomfortable as that is to say, if it meets the objective in the story, then they'll be less likely to release the floodwaters. Uh, so too, uh, the, develop, the, the use of uh, an industrial zone like Kaesong uh, should be linked, the action should be linked to the story. Uh, demining, uh, if there are demining efforts that have to be done, the action should fit the story. And that's true for the South as well. If the action doesn't fit the story of increasing prosperity and freedom along with stability, then the South Korean government won't, won't go along with the objective. So in every case, and I think this is really important in escalated conflicts because they become very irrational. You have to work on the emotional level, and this is what I think the interesting and odd example of Donald Trump taught us, is that in every case, and I suspect that this is something that, that Donald Trump conveyed uh, in his meetings, that what the United, this is the irony of America first. We also respect your sovereignty and your ability to protect yourself, which fits the story. You see that action fits the North Korean story. And every effort that doesn't fit the story will be rejected because it's so critical uh, for the story to win over reality. And the important thing is that the story is more important than reality for a regime like this. So you have to make sure the action fits the story or else you can put yourself in real danger. Yeah, Tom and, uh... Next, I would like to invite um... Mr. Mats Engman from the Institute for Security and Development Policy. Thank you very much. I have a very, very uh, short answer to your questions about one advice. And I think uh, domestically here in South Korea, a much better bipartisan coordination and a longer term perspective uh, to solve and make this initiative uh, doable. Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, Ambassador of Israel, Your Excellency Akiva Tor, if you could also. I just share two points. Uh, in all of our conflicts with, our, um, with the Palestinians, which have gone up and gone down, the uh, cooperation on veterinary disease and making sure that livestock on both sides of the borders stayed healthy never broke down. Uh, also, Every border fence that we've ever built, we've tried to have movement for natural habitat. The animals should be kept out of the conflict as much as possible. And that's one thing. Uh, just one point I wanted to say, not as an official position of the State of Israel, but as my own observation at a conference like this, I think that Koreans should take heart. Uh, at the end of the day, I think people who are looking from the outside feel that it's inconceivable that there won't come a day uh, when the Korean Peninsula and the Korean people will be reunited. Just like it's a force of gravity, uh, the division doesn't make sense, and in the fullness of time, it will surely be resolved. Thank you. Thank you for your words of hope for the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. Mr. Ambassador, lastly, I would like to ask Professor Junya for a piece of advice. 
다음에는 균형을 잡는 노력이 필요하다고 생각을 합니다. 아, 어떻게 보면은 현실적인 관점에서 There needs to be an effort to strike the balance uh, in power. And at the same time, uh, we need efforts to uh, pursue a desirable, stable order. And progressive Korean governments tend to focus too much on inter-Korean relations, whereas the uh, conservative governments of Korea rather tend to focus a lot uh, on international relations. So in that, uh, on that front, we need a balance as well. Thank you so much. It is time to wrap up today. We talked about the green Tetang Te between South and North Korea vision and tasks during this first session. Due to time constraints, uh, it is regrettable that we are unable to take the questions and comments from the floor. I ask for your generous understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, once again, let us give a big round of applause to the moderator. Thank you very much for facilitating the discussion. Thank you. And now we have heard various views regarding the green detente on the Korean Peninsula. So of course, that there have been differing views, but also some commonalities as well. So for example, as the moderator has pointed out, conversation, communication, and ongoing efforts, I would say that these are the three key words. And also, it cannot be a one-sided effort, meaning that we need to have close cooperation down the road. So thank you very much for that, and I do believe that these will be important messages for the participants as well. And as we were uh, having the session, I could also see that we have had a lot of participants on the online channel as well. So once again, thank you very much for that.